All right, welcome back, everybody. I thought we had a great start this morning. Um, well on our way to uh, being inebriated with ideas. So I, I've, got a, I've got an idea buzz going now. I don't know about you, but. So we're gonna, we're gonna talk about the natural world. We were talking about canaries in the coal mine. Kerry was saying that uh, the, you know, the, the weather is as much in anyth as anything uh, a canary in the coal mine. Uh, I, I, it's kind of an overused cliche, but um, you know, we are looking for the trends. And one of the places where you can see the effects of climate change uh, and have seen it kind of in the vanguard is in the oceans. And uh, there's a lot to be concerned about with uh, fisheries. I know that's been a huge story here in uh, Massachusetts with the collapse of cod and the misunderstanding about how uh, much trouble the, the cod stocks were in. Uh, and of course, I, I happen to be an avid scuba diver and just uh, in my experience over the past 25 or 30 years of scuba diving have seen a place I go to, um, it's coral severely diminished. And uh, it's very sad to go back there and see this, just this kind of slow motion train wreck underway. So let's, let's go under the sea, if, we, if you will, and let's uh, see um, how uh, much we should be worried. And also, because we want to stay true uh, to our theme, where the opportunities may lie. Um, Carl Safina is um, a um, writer uh, who has been recognized with MacArthur, Pew, and Guggenheim Fellowships. And he has written extensively about the ocean. Emily Darling is with the Wildlife Conservation Society. And um, we're lucky to have her above the surface, from what I gather. I think she mostly prefers to be underwater. And uh, Paul Greenberg uh, has written extensively about uh, fisheries and the collapse of uh, fisheries and wrote a bestseller called Four Fish, which I have a feeling you know something about. So we'll hear for the same uh, format. We'll hear their presentations and uh, have some co a conversation with them afterwards. And uh, why don't you uh, give Carl Safina a nice warm welcome. OK. Is that my first slide, the black one? OK. So I have, a, um, I have a little bit of a confession to make, and that is that I'm not going to talk about climate change, really. Um, and I'll tell you kind of why. I do um, mainly work in the ocean. I'm mostly an ocean ecologist. I have been. And we've been talking about the collapse of fisheries in New England for 25 years. They're still pretty collapsed. Uh, We've been talking about climate change for about 25 years, still have the problems. And uh, A, um, we all ask ourselves, how, how can we not just convey information, but what's the story? How can we come up with a, a, a different story, I guess, was my frustration. So um, it occurred to me that when we talk about conservation, uh, and I'm, most, my, I'm mostly concerned with the continuity of life on Earth. And uh, we always talk about numbers. We say the ocean is warming at this rate. Carbon dioxide is dissolving into the ocean at this rate. It's creating acidification that is robbing uh, calcium carbonate from animals that need to build skeletons. And uh, there's obviously something about this that doesn't quite come across as much as it needs to. So it, it seemed to me that we talk a lot about what is at stake, but we never talk about who is at stake. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. And I'm going to talk about that in very big terms. Not, it's not specific to the ocean, and it's not specific to climate. Although I did put a climate-related slide as my very last slide. So anyway, OK, let's go. Oh, that's up to me. OK, <laughs> sorry. It is up to me. Um, so have you ever wondered what animals think and feel? Yes. Have you ever asked yourself, does my dog really love me, or does she just want a treat? Yes. <laughs> Clearly, our dog really loves us. And that's obvious, right? It's, it's obvious, except it's not always so obvious. What is going on in those furry little heads? Something is going on. And why is the question always, do they love us? Why is it always about us? 
why are we such thorough narcissists? <laughs> so I came up with a different question. Who are you? There are characteristics of the human mind, capacities of the human mind. We all know that. Are they capacities only of the human mind? There are some other big brains out there. What are these creatures doing with these brains? How could we possibly know what other animals think and feel, even if other animals think and feel? Well, I think there are a few ways in. You can look at the brain, can look at evolution, can observe behavior. First thing is that the brain began in the ocean. Jellyfish were the first things that had nerves. Nerves led eventually to spinal cords. Spinal cords led eventually to spinal columns. Animals with spinal columns came out on land and have been causing trouble ever since. It's still true, though, that if you look at the nerve cell of a jellyfish or a crayfish or a dog or a person, the nerve cells are pretty indistinguishable. They basically look the same. So a question then is, what does a crayfish feel and experience? And it turns out that if you give a crayfish little electric shocks every time it comes out to look for food, it develops what appears to be an anxiety syndrome, and it stops coming. But if you give it the same drug used to treat anxiety in humans, it relaxes and it starts foraging again. Do we celebrate or show our concern about the uh, anxieties of crayfish? No, mostly we boil them. Octopi, which are not even vertebrates, use tools better than most apes, and they recognize human faces. How do we celebrate the ape-like intelligence of octopi? Mostly we boil them. If a grouper chases a small fish into a crevice in the coral, it will often go to where it knows a moray eel is sleeping. It will signal to the moray in a way that the moray eel understands. That means, come with me. I have somebody trapped. The moray will follow the grouper. It will go into the crevice. Sometimes it will nab the fish. Sometimes the fish will bolt, and the grouper will get it. This is a partnership that's been going on for millions of years, probably. We've known about it for about a decade. And when I say we, I mean the six people who know about it. <laughs> we celebrate that partnership mostly between two buns. Otters teach. Teaching means when you stop doing what you're doing to show somebody else what to do. Chimpanzees don't teach. Otters teach. Killer whales teach. They teach very complicated hunting techniques. And they also share their food in a way that's crucial for the survival of individuals in the group. When we look at the human brain, we see that it comes from other brains. Evolution works with what it has in stock off the shelf before it fabricates a new twist. So our brain, is an, our brain is an elaboration on earlier brains, and it comes to us through the incredible sweep of time. If you, look at, if you look at the human brain compared to a chimpanzee brain, you see that basically we have a very big chimpanzee brain. And we all feel very relieved to hear that because we're, we also have the vainest brain in nature. But uh-oh, there's a dolphin. A much bigger brain, more convolutions. What is it doing? Now you could say, OK, well, that's just brains. What does that say about anything? You can see a brain, but you can't see a mind. right? But yes, you can see the workings of a mind in behavior. So for instance, everybody can see that these elephants are relaxed. Why do they look relaxed? Because they are relaxed. 
you can see that they've chosen a spot of shade under the palms to let their babies sleep while the adults doze but remain vigilant. Why does that make sense to us? Because that's how it makes sense to them. Because on the same plains and savannas, under the arc of the same sun, listening to the roars and howls of the same enemies, we became who we are, they became who they are. We have the same imperatives, and our minds respond in very similar ways. Nobody would look at these and say they're relaxed. They're obviously concerned about something. What are they concerned about? It turns out that if you hide a speaker in a bush, and through the same speaker in the same bush, you play the recorded conversations of tourists who never bother elephants, the tourists act like they don't even hear it. They completely ignore it. If you play the conversations of herders who do hurt elephants, the elephants will bunch up and run away. They recognize the difference between human languages. They put different kinds of humans in different categories that are relevant to them. They've been watching us carefully for longer than we've been watching them carefully. They know who they are, they know what's going on in their lives, and they know what's important to them. And we see the same imperatives. Care of the young, whether the adults are outfitted in an outer body that's uh, made for hiking or made for diving. We have the same organs, the same skeleton. We really just differ in the outer contours mainly. We see help where help is needed. We see curiosity mainly in the young. We see the expression of strong family bonds. And we recognize that expression, whether it's something that's closer to us like a mammal or a little bit more distant like a bird. Courtship is courtship. And then we ask, are they even conscious? That seems like such a silly question to me. When you get general anesthesia, you are made unconscious. It means that you are disconnected from any sense of your sensory input. Consciousness is simply the thing that feels like something. Obviously, they, they are aware of their senses. They have eyes to see. They have ears to hear. They have those nice little noses. They have fun and they play. And then people say, well, but they don't have empathy. Only humans have empathy. Well, empathy is only and simply the mind's ability to match the mood of a companion. You seem happy, makes me feel happy. You seem distressed, makes me feel a little distressed. You're obviously sad, I'm concerned. So my mind matches your mood. Empathy turns out to be one of the most important things for any animal that moves around in a group. You have to match what your companions are doing. If everybody you're with suddenly startles and flies away, it does not work for you to stand around saying, oh, I wonder why everybody just left. <laughs> like anything in life, I think that empathy exists on a sliding scale, and I have these three categories that I create. I call it basic empathy, which is feeling with another, and sympathy, which is a little more separated. I'm sorry your grandmother just passed away. I don't feel the same grief you do, but I kind of understand it. And then a motivation to act to help, which I call compassion. Empathy, far from being the thing that makes us human, is very imperfect in humans. We round up, we round up empathic animals, and we kill them, and we eat them. And uh, you might easily say, oh, well, I'm being a sentimentalist, and I'm being sort of an alarmist here because we all love dogs. But it's a different species. We're predators. One species eats another. Predation is a natural thing. So that has nothing to do with empathy. It's just predation. But we don't treat our own kind so well either. 
People who know only one thing about animal behavior seem all to know that you must never attribute human thoughts and emotions to other species. This, of course, is called anthropomorphism. Everybody seems to know this very awkward word. Well, I would like to stand here and tell you that attributing human thoughts and emotions to other species is probably the very best first guess you can make about what they're doing and why they're doing it and a little something about what they're experiencing internally in their minds. It is not scientific to say they're hungry when they're hunting and they're exhausted when their tongues are hanging out and then when they're playing with their families, say, we don't know what they can experience. We have no idea, no way of knowing. That is not scientific. That's a story that we tell ourselves because it's our favorite story. Our favorite story is we are categorically special. We're totally different than anything else on this planet with us. And that means we're the best. And that's our favorite story. It's not scientific. So a reporter said to me, OK, OK, all right, you've, you've told me all of these things, but how do you really know that other animals can think and feel? And I immediately did what we would probably do, is my mind was rifling through all the science papers and all the references that I had used in writing this book. And then I thought, well, no, wait a second. The answer is right here on the floor. When my dog gets off the rug and comes over to me, and rolls over on her back so that I can rub her belly. She's showing, I had a thought. I'd like him to rub my belly. <laughs> I'm not going to the couch. The couch doesn't rub my belly. Carl rubs my belly. He's my friend and part of my family. I know I can trust him completely. I know he'll know what I'm asking for. And I know he'll get the job done. <laughs> She can think and she can feel. We, sim we sometimes see animals. Some of us are lucky enough to see real animals in real places. Others of us see them on TV. And we say, oh, look, elephants. Oh, look, killer whales. That's what we say. But that's not how life is for them. That male there is uh, a 36-year-old male. He is L22, and next to him is a 42-year-old female, and she is L42. And um, they've known each other for decades. That's an elephant that people called Philo. That's Philo four days later. Humans don't only have the capacity to feel grief, we have the capacity to create an enormous amount of it. We want to carve their teeth. Why can't we wait for them to die? In Roman times, elephants in Africa lived from the shores of the Mediterranean down to the Cape. Uh, in the 1980s, they still had vast strongholds. Now their range is fragmented and disconnected. This is the geography of the greatest animal on Earth going extinct, being driven extinct by us. Of course, we do much better in our own national parks. In Yellowstone, rangers killed the last wolf, one of the last wolves south of the Canadian border at the time. And then 60-something years later, we put wolves back because elk had become out of control. And it generated a multi-million dollar uh, business of people going to Yellowstone and watching the wolves. There is one wolf pack. A pack is a family, just two or three breeding adults and their babies. Um, that's a wolf pack. So there was this wolf pack, very stable pack, led by this incredible female, incredibly competent hunter, uh, wonderful manager of the family the most famous wolf. And then Congress took wolves off the Endangered Species Act in 2012. And when that pack wandered just outside the border of the park, that female, the, the matriarch of the pack, the alpha female, was shot. One of the adult males was shot. And immediately, this stable family descended into fighting and um, just spiraled uh, kind of out of control and broke apart. So 
The sister who was the protege of the mother was driven out by her apparently jealous sisters. The alpha male was driven out. He had, uh, he had been the alpha male of the most stable pack in Yellowstone. He lost his territory, his family, his hunting partners, and everything else. We caused them an unbelievable amount of pain. A question is, we hurt them so much, why don't they hurt us a lot more? Why is it that this whale that has just finished eating part of a gray whale that it and its companions killed will not bother those people in that boat? They have nothing to fear at all. That whale just finished ripping apart a seal that weighed about as much as those two people. Those two people have absolutely nothing to be concerned about. Why is that? Why is it that they eat seals, they don't eat us? We can trust them around our toddlers. There are numerous cases where killer whales that people were pursuing uh, to observe, scientists were pursuing to observe, but they knew the scientists, they were familiar with them. Scientists get lost in fog, killer whales go away, five minutes later, killer whales come back. They get in front of the boat, the scientists say, okay, we'll follow them. They go 15 miles, the fog parts, and the guy's house, the researcher's house, is right there. Why is that? In the Bahamas, a researcher named Denise Herzing goes out for about three weeks at a time to study these spotted dolphins. She knows them as individuals. They know her. One day they show up. The dolphins won't come near the boat. This is extremely unusual, because usually when she shows up, they're all very happy to see her again. Somebody came, comes out on deck and says, one of the volunteers just died in a nap in his bunk. Why would the dolphins be spooked by the fact that a human had died? How could they possibly know that one of the hearts on the boat had stopped beating? These are capacities of minds that are not our minds, but they're capacities that are there, and we know almost nothing about them at all. In South Africa, in an aquarium, there was a baby dolphin named Dolly. One day, one of the aquarium workers was on a break, and he was smoking a cigarette outside the window to Dolly's pool. Dolly came over and looked at him. Then she went to her mother, and she nursed. Then she came back to the window, and she blew a cloud of milk that enveloped her head like a cloud of smoke. <laughs> Somehow, Dolly had the idea. She had the idea, how can I imitate him? Oh, I know, milk. When humans use one thing to represent something else, we call that art. The things that make us human are not the things that we like to tell ourselves are the things that make us human. Love is not the thing that makes us human. What makes us human, it seems to me, is that we are the most extreme animal. We are the most creative, the most destructive, the most compassionate, and the most violent animal that this planet has ever known. And we are all of those things at the same time. We're not the only ones who care about our children or each other. Albatrosses frequently fly six to 10,000 miles over several weeks to bring back one big meal for their chicks. It takes six months for the chicks to grow. Albatrosses nest in the most remote islands in the world. This is Laysan Island. It's dead in the center of the North Pacific Ocean, farther from any continent than any other group of islands, and that's what it looks like there. Passing life from one generation to the next is the chain of being. That chain gets cut, it ends. And in that chain right now are the screw tops of plastic jars and all kinds of other junk. This albatross was about six months old and ready to fledge, and it died, and it was packed with red cigarette lighters. That is not the way the world is supposed to be, and it's not the relationship we're supposed to have with the world. It's not the relationship we want to have with the world. When we are about to welcome new human life into this world, we paint the nurseries with pictures of all our living companions, because we want to welcome our children into a world that is filled with life. And every one of those animals is endangered now. And their flood is us. So we started out by saying, by asking a question, the question was, do they love us? 
And the question I'm going to leave you with is, do we love them? Do we really have what it takes to let them simply remain with us on Earth? Thank you. When you, when you look at animals with, with this kind of perspective, how, how should that uh, change the way we think about and respond to climate change? What's the opportunity there? Well, because I, I think that what it, you know, what it shows is that this is really, um, it really is a moral imperative that we, uh, we are not, we have no moral claim to the world and the continuity of, of life. We are stewards that are here for a, a brief moment out of a very deep past that hopefully should continue into a very long future. And that um, we need, you know, many people say that it's not worth doing anything about climate change because nothing could change in our lifetimes. And um, I just think that that's completely wrong-headed, and I think that the right, the right posture and the right response is we need to do the right thing, because it's not about us, and it's not about now. It's about all of us, all together, through the deep sweep of time. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, let's do, let's look at coral reefs, and we turn now to Emily Darling. Emily, come on up. How's that? Um, well, thank you very much, WGBH, for this invitation. And Miles, I'm very happy to be above water with you here today. Um, it's okay. There we go. Uh, I think one slide back. We're good. There we go. So today, I would love to tell you some good news from nature. And specifically, I'd like to take you around the world to tropical coral reefs. Tropical coral reefs are some of the most beautiful, electric, and eclectic ecosystems on our planet. But who here has heard doom and gloom stories about coral reefs? A lot of hands just went up. Right, so before we get to the good news, we need to talk about the backstory. 75% of the world's coral reefs are threatened by local stressors, including fishing, coastal development, and pollution, as well as climate change. We've heard a lot about ocean acidification. I'm going to tell you about ocean warming. There's also rising sea levels. Basically, there are a lot of problems for coral reefs. Um, and in fact, our children, and maybe even our grandchildren, may not see a coral reef that looks like this today. That's not just, oops, there's, I think there's, is, am I clicking the wrong one? There should be one more slide. And there's, yeah. OK. Um, so that's not just, hum that's not just um, nature's loss. That's actually humanity's loss. 500 million people in some of the most vulnerable countries around the world depend on these reefs here for protection from coastal s storm surges or tsunamis, food security, as well as their coastal livelihoods. So today, my two good news stories. The first story is going to start in East Africa on the coast of uh, Kenya in Mombasa. I'm going to talk to you about some climate refuges we're discovering and then scale up and go around the world from there. The second story I'd like to tell you starts in the Pacific Ocean, and we're going to learn from communities who have been sustainably fishing their reefs for thousands of years. So here in Mombasa, Kenya, scientists from the Wildlife Conservation Society have been studying these reefs for over 30 years. And it's my great pleasure to tell you some stories from WCS scientists in the next few minutes. Coral uh, coastal communities in Kenya, like many communities around the world, depend on coral reefs for their fisheries and for their livelihoods. By fishing fish like this that you see in this picture, it puts uh, money in people's pockets and food on the table to feed their families. These are some of the fishermen I've worked with, and they know that their actions have consequences for, these, for both the fish that they're pulling out and the delicate habitats. But that's a problem for tomorrow because it's simply not a problem that they can afford to have today. And you can see those impacts when you started diving. So when I started diving uh, during my PhD 10 years ago, you can see these impacts. 
fished reefs, there's not a lot of fish, first of all. And a lot of the corals are small, and it's very low diversity. But just like Kenya's famous national parks on land, there are also national parks in Kenya's oceans. They've been protected for 30 or 40 years. And when we dive underwater on those reefs, first of all, we see a lot more fish. And that's not terribly surprising, because we know when we stop killing fish, we get a lot more fish, up to 10 times more fish. But as a coral ecologist, I wanted to swim closer and actually look at the habitats. And here's where we something, see something really unusual. There's not actually that much different. You still see these uh, large, slow-growing corals, not a ton of species, not like the pages of a National Geographic shoot. Our research has shown that this is a legacy of climate change. In 1998, a massive marine heat wave sat on the world's coral reefs, uh, just like the one that's just been announced several weeks ago by NOAA. The world's third largest coral bleach is currently sitting, starting to sit on our coral reefs now. But back in 1998, we had a bleaching event. Um, and our research showed that this climate change event, where an El Nino provo provoked very warm temperatures, led to this breakdown in bleaching, that that was actually a stronger driver than fishing for these corals. And climate change really is the elephant in the room for how we try to think about conservation and management on coral reefs. And in fact, if we don't consider the effects of climate change, instead of coral reefs, we may end up with coral boneyards. But this was Kenya. Uh, and so where does my good news come in? Well, it comes in actually about 1,000 kilometers south, further, further south along the African coastline, here in northern Mozambique, uh, in the northern Mozambique Channel. Working with scientists from Madagascar and Mozambique, we've discovered reefs that look like this just a few years ago. Fields of branching and plating corals, some of the highest diversity in the region. You can see them again here. This was a photo from just a few months ago. Our team was underwater, and just the most beautiful corals I had ever seen. This is a climate refuge, a place that we think has escaped the worst effects of climate change. We think that because of its position in the northern Mozambique Channel, when all that water pooled in the Indian Ocean in 1998 and rushed across to Kenya, these reefs never got that hot water. As well as by their position in this unique oceanographic channel, we know that there are strong gyres and eddies, deep coral canyons that pull cold water up um, that basically cool these reefs off. So we've basically got a hot spot of biodiversity in a cool spot of climate. So over the last two years, I've been leading a project searching for other climate refuges. I've asked scientists around the world to uh, contribute their largely unpublished data so that we can see one of the first pictures of coral diversity at the scale of climate change, which is at the scale of our oceans. We've amassed information from over 2,300 sites, working with nearly 100 scientists, and have information on over 35,000 individual corals. What we're able to show with this is sort of like an investment plan for coral reef conservation. What I'd like to show you is that coral reefs, those 2,300 sites, uh, are driven by two primary axes. We know that those different sites vary in how much biodiversity they contain, like those earlier pictures I was showing you. And we also know that those reefs have very different modeled predictions of climate change and coral bleaching risk. Some reefs are expected to bleach much more than others. And when we look at the distribution of those 2,300 reefs, we actually see that they occur all over this plot. And we can use this information sort of like a data-driven portfolio of different actions in different places. For example, we can think about four different ways we might make climate-smart investments in conservation. Here in areas of low climate stress, that's really where we want to think about managing or conserving biodiversity. So thinking about how do we protect and connect climate refuges that have a lot of that biodiversity? Or how do we make smart investments in coral reef restoration to bring that biodiversity back up? Here in this quadrant, this is a good investment for coral restoration because we don't expect it to be swamped out by the next climate change event. Uh, other, on the other hand, we've got areas of high climate stress that we absolutely need to deal with. In some places, we might see a better picture than we expect. Those are areas we need to look for innovation and adaptation. On the other hand, we have a lot of red dots. These, this is where Kenya lives. These are where those fishermen that I introduced you to earlier, this is where they fish. Here, we need to really think about climate-tolerant resources that will continue to support coastal livelihoods. For example, in Kenya, a lot of the catch that people uh, 
a lot of the cat, fisheries catch, is actually from a seagrass species, about 40% of the catch. And so here we really need to think about precautionary management of climate tolerant resources like those seagrass fish um, and recognize that coral reef resources might fundamentally change. So there are ways that scientists are working together all over the world to make that elephant in the room just a little bit smaller. My second story, I'd like to completely shift gears and talk a little bit about sustainable fisheries and what wildlife conservation so uh, society scientists are learning from traditional fishing practices. My story starts uh, on that tiny island in Koro, uh, in Fiji, where uh, the price of the story that I'm going to tell you was actually the largest tooth that I've ever seen. It was a tooth of a sperm whale that we presented to the chiefs in this village by candlelight in a thatch shack. And then after three claps, we were officially invited to join the village. We were here to learn about a traditional Pacific uh, fishing practice called tambus, where villages that have sea tenure as well as land tenure set aside areas of their reefs for a number of years to let their fish crops regrow. During a special event, uh, like the death of a chief or a religious ceremony, the village will open up its reef for a period of, of usually a few days, everyone will go out and fish, and then they'll close it off again and let that crop regrow. The harvest that we were invited to participate in uh, was to pay school fees for the village. So on the day of the harvest, 150 men, women, and children from the village, as well as us researchers, showed up driven by the sound of this conch shell. I showed up in my uh, black neoprene wetsuit uh, with hot pink accents and dive booties uh, and a mask and snorkel. Um, and everyone else showed up in much more normal clothes. Uh, so here are some of our Fijian fishermen wearing t-shirts and shorts, a sweater, homemade goggles. Uh, you can see this yellow uh, fishing or petrol buoy. Uh, they use sort of as a life jacket, so a float along as you swam out. So you can imagine that I felt quite overdressed. Uh, nonetheless, we all swam out to the reef, and the only fishing gear we had was this half-mile-long fishing vine that had been cut from the forest above the village earlier that morning. The men had gone out in a speedboat earlier and draped this vine all along the reef, and so we swam out, and everyone held on to a section of the reef about the size of my fore or the, the thickness of my forearm. Over the next hour, we ferociously swam towards the center of the reef, pulling that lasso even tighter. We would splash the vine against the water and kick the water with our feet to scare any fish that we came across into the middle. So after about an hour, we had started to come much closer together, and we had scared a whole bunch of fish here into the middle. And when I looked into the middle, it was just complete chaos. Uh, there's a frantic ball of yellow and blue and brown fish all kind of swimming around, very completely unsure of what had just happened to them. Uh, this was not you know, a normal uh, fish that you see on the reef. Something different was happening here. At one point, uh, a, a large brown grouper tries to escape the ball of fish, just like a lot of other fish had, and he swims right at me. Time seemed to slow down, and I sort of glanced to my right and my left, and there are two large Fijians next to me the size of football players, and they weren't, they weren't looking. And so I see this fish coming at me, and I have this urge to let him pass, to let him leave and escape and start to regrow the next generation of crops. But I held my ground and kicked him back into the center because we were all there to learn together about sustainable fishing practices. And while I was reflecting on that moment, all of a sudden it was complete chaos. The conch horn had sounded again, and everyone drops the vine and rushes the entire ball of fish into a net on the other side of the circle. Knives are pulled out. The men next to me pull out their knives. They start stabbing fish and killing them into the net as, we, as they're harvesting everything that we had just pushed into the middle of the reef. All of the fish were collected here in this net. And a, a team of very strong Fijian men, it took a whole bunch of them to get all of these fish onto the boat. There's about over 1,000 fish. Actually, there was 1,003 fish because we counted each and every single one of them later that day. By night, the researchers and the community counted each one of those fish. We identified each one to species and measured every fish to the nearest centimeter. By studying these harvests, or studying these reefs before and after a harvest, as well as studying the sustainability of a harvest, uh, we're learning that these 
uh, fish harvests are sustainable, but only if they're not harvested too much or too often. By co-creating this knowledge with local communities, science is learning from traditional fishing practices. And at the same time, traditional cultures are learning what is sustainable in these more modern times. Instead of fishing only during religious ceremonies or for the death of a chief, people uh, want to fish more to pay school fees or to, to go buy other things from the mainland. So what is sustainable is a way that we really need to co-create this knowledge. At the Wildlife Conservation Society, I'm currently leading a project that learns from fisheries in, in Kenya, in Fiji, as well as around the world. We're bringing together partnerships and big data sets to look at what is the state of the reefs underwater, what are the fisheries landings of those sites, and how are people governing these reefs and benefiting from them. And the whole point here is to learn from traditional practices because we know that what works in Kenya isn't necessarily what's going to work in Kenya. There's obviously very different cultural histories to these places and also a very different history of climate change. What happens in Kenya in terms of what kinds of climate shocks their reefs will be exposed to is not necessarily going to be the same as what happens in Kenya. So we're working around the world. We're working with a lot of partners. And I've got some more information about this I'd be happy to share with you later. So in summary, I find coral reefs to be remarkable places with remarkable stories of conservation and of hope and of opportunities. Scientists are working together to scale up our response to climate change, our understanding to climate change. And we're trying to do that at a scale that actually matches climate change. So moving out from our individual studies and our little silos to actually working together to create collaborative big data. Scientists are also learning from traditional cultural practices that have sustained fisheries for thousands of years. And we're sure, and we already are learning a lot of things from them that we hope will continue uh, to sustain fisheries into the future of climate change. So there certainly are reasons for hope and for optimism and for opportunity. Uh, and I think that we not only need good news from nature, but we also need good news from the people who live next to nature. Uh, and I think that is how, all together, that we're going to find some good news and opportunities for climate change. To learn more, uh, please join us at the Wildlife Conservation Society. I look forward to questions on the panel afterwards. I'd like to thank the partners and funders who have made this work possible, uh, who have let me tell their stories to you today. And as everyone in this room knows, none of this work gets done without our partnerships on the ground uh, and, and the communities uh, that we work with. Thank you very much. So uh, the, the discovery of that coral reef that was so much healthier, a thousand miles to the south, mm -hmm. that kind of implies that the coral is more moving as opposed to diminishing. Is that what scientists think, or is it diminishing and moving? Yeah. Well, corals are sessile animals, so they don't actually move. But the certain broader patterns right. of where are the hot spots or cool spots of, of diversity, yeah, that's changing. And so part of it is trying to keep up with it. So one of our ideas, or a lot of people are talking about moving target marine protected areas. So as coral communities shift, likely with environmental patterns, how can our governance and management keep up with that? Do we know enough, though? Have we seen enough coral reefs to say one way or another how much trouble collectively coral is globally? I think they're, they're certainly in trouble. But I think what I'm trying to highlight is there are places that we're, we expect yeah. them to survive. We're starting to understand the oceanographic mechanisms behind that survival. And we also know that corals, while the adults are stuck on the reef, they don't move, their larvae, their babies can disperse very, very far on ocean, ocean currents. And so even finding potential high latitude refuges or equatorial refuges that their babies can move into, those can be important places for conservation as well. All right. Thanks, Emily. Thank you. More in just a bit. Paul Greenberg has written for fish, and we'll continue the subject of uh, fisheries and concerns we might have about them. Paul, thanks. Thank you. Hello. Um, oh, right. I have one of these. Um, so I'm here to talk about that other food system, um, the, the ooh, back one. There you go. Uh, that other food system, the fish system. Um, I often end up in places sort of being the lone fish guy amongst other food people. And I, recently I was, um, I was out in Berkeley and uh, I met with Michael Pollan. We were having coffee. And I was looking at Michael and he looked good. I mean, he looked really, you know, he had a really nice like shirt and he just looked, looked really happy. And, and then I thought about it for a second. I realized that when you look at how we Americans eat food, we eat about 200 pounds of land food meat per year and about 15 pounds of seafood. And I, 
was looking at Michael, his, his shirt, my shirt, and I thought, does this play out in terms of royalties? I'm not really quite sure. Um, but but it, 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 as we go forward into this era of extreme climate change, um, I think that seafood really has to start to be much more part of the conversation, as we'll see later on in my talk. So in any case, I came to this whole topic um, as a fisherman. And um, when I was a kid, this was my team. Um, I was, was terrible at sports. Um, I didn't like to watch them. I didn't like to play them. So my season was the seasons of these fish coming in and out of the greater New York Bight around where uh, I lived and fished. Um, but after I went to college and, and came back and started fishing again, I found that my team had gone from this to this. That a lot of the creatures that I sort of thought of as being my neighborhood, being my people, my creatures, um, that they had just completely disappeared. Um, and then when I started going to fish markets, um, I noticed that there was kind of something similar going on on the fish markets on ice. Which was that when you went to a fish market, yeah, you still saw a little bit of this, a little bit of that. But at the center of the seafood case was always this kind of repetition of four things. You always saw some shrimp. You saw some tuna. You saw some white fish, i.e. cod. But now we're seeing other things doing that role. And you saw salmon. But I realized that, that even that was a little bit removed um, from what the average consumer experienced when they thought about the ocean and seafood. In fact, the average person who was not a fish person when they went to the you know, thought about the ocean, this is what they thought about. They really just thought about these four flesh archetypes. Um, they didn't really care what they did with their lives. They didn't really care uh, how they lived before they became a piece of flesh. That's all they really cared about. They wanted to have something pink and succulent that you could broil, something like shrimpy that they could put in cocktail sauce, something steaky that they could put on hibachi, and something white and flaky that they could fry. So that's sort of where we were headed. And then I realized that when you started to look at the scope of human evolution and the way that humans have related to the natural world, that this has actually happened before. Um, if you go back 10,000 years ago to the dawn of animal husbandry, before, before animal husbandry, you find literally dozens of mammals in the fire pits of Neolithic humans. Telescope to the age of Christ, you see four cattle, pigs, um, sheep, and goats. And this is also actually true um, of birds. Um, I was having uh, lunch a while back uh, with the great uh, writer Mark Herlansky, and he was doing a book about oysters at the time. And he was showing me all the menus from 19th century New York. He said, look at all the birds on the menu. Snipe, woodcock, grouse, many kinds of ducks, many kinds of geese. Um, there were actually professional shooters who stood out in the pothole lakes of the Midwest and just blasted commercial quantities of ducks and geese. Now we have four. So how are we getting to this point of four uh, in our seafood system? And, and what are the choices that are involved around that? Well, to begin with, what we've seen in the last 50, 60 years since the end of World War II is just a huge increase in the amount of fish that we catch. Um, we've gone from about 15 million metric tons a year to over 80 million metric tons a year. And that's pretty much flattened out in the last few years. Um, and just to put that in sort of, you know, Carlos talks about these are just numbers. Well, let's think about what that number is. Right now, we take out of the ocean the human weight of China every single year. Um, pretty, pretty extreme. I mean, on the one hand, you could sit, look at this as just a miserable thing, horrible that we're taking this much fish out of the ocean every year. On the other hand, you can look at, even during this incredibly stressful time on the planet, wow, the ocean still produces a China's worth of fish each and every year. But that's just half the story. The other thing that's going on with seafood right now is a tremendous rise in what we call aquaculture, fish farming, mariculture, whatever you want to call it. This has dramatically risen in the last um, 50 years um, to the point where uh, you know, 100 years ago, pretty much everything we ate from the sea was wild. We're just crossing the threshold now where something like half of it is coming from farms. And uh, curiously, um, we're now, t you know, the combination of aquaculture and fishing is equaling the equivalent of two Chinas taken out of the sea each and every year. And it's not a coincidence, by the way, that I use China here as the example, because not only is China the largest catcher of wild fish, it is also the largest grower of farmed fish in the world. So let's look at our individual choices. Though. Let's look at the four that we've been doing so far. So shrimp stands out there as a remarkably uh, tough choice for us to have made. Um, when you catch shrimp in the wild, shrimp are well shrimpy. They're little. So you have to drag a very fine mesh net through the water. This results in a tremendous amount of what we're calling bycatch. Um, sometimes 5 pounds, sometimes 10 pounds, sometimes 15 pounds of other things killed so that we can get our pound of shrimp. It's also very fuel inefficient. Uh, dragging the bottom for crustaceans 
um, according to a recent paper that came out of Dalhousie, is one of the most fuel intensive things that we can do when we're trying to obtain seafood protein. Um, we can also try to farm shrimp. And in fact, more than half of our shrimp today is coming to us from farms. But that also has a very severe uh, environmental effect tied to climate change. Um, this is a mangrove forest, a picture I took in Vietnam a few years ago. Um, this is the way a mangrove forest should look. Uh, those beautiful roots holding down the soil. It's a tremendously productive ecosystem that produces not only juvenile shrimp, but juvenile fish. Very, very important to uh, coastal ecosystems. This is what happens when shrimp farms move in. Um, shrimp farms have uh, multiplied at a tremendous rate since the 1970s. We've lost millions of acres of mangrove forests. It's true that now shrimp farming is much more sensitive. Um, m much fewer acres of uh, mangrove are actually being destroyed at this point. Um, but we still are in a huge mangrove deficit. And some people have put forth the idea that some of these major typhoons that have hit, like uh, Typhoon Haiyan that hit the Philippines, uh, one of the reasons that was such an extreme event was because so many mangrove forests had been cleared out by things like shrimp farming. The other thing that goes on with shrimp farming um, is this other weird thing, which is I mentioned before that you can have 5, 10, 15 pounds of bycatch for every pound of shrimp. Well, so what happens to all that bycatch? This is uh, from a Thai trawler. Um, all that bycatch increasingly um, in Southeast Asia is being ground up and turned into, you guessed it, shrimp food. So we literally have an ecosystem that's eating its own guts, taking all of this diversity and turning it back into shrimp. The next most popular uh, seafood in, in the United States right now, and indeed around the world, is tuna. So tuna, um, we think of it as this kind of little contained creature in a can. Uh, but it's actually um, harvested from these vast, vast areas called, that are managed by what are called regional fisheries management organizations. Our particular regional fisheries management organization is called ICAT, the International Convention for the Conservation of Atlantic Tunas. Carl Safina, uh, very humorously, a few years back, uh, dubbed it the International Conspiracy to Catch All the Tuna. Um, uh, but, um, you know, They've improved their management in recent years. But nevertheless, you're looking at vast areas that have to be managed in order to so -called, uh, produce so-called sustainable tuna. In addition to this, a large amount of tuna are taken from the area of the oceans that is pretty much owned by, nothing, by no one, nobody, the high seas, um, outside of the 200-mile exclusive economic zone that nations count as their exclusive property to fish. This will also become an issue as climate change progresses. As all those Pacific islands start to sink and disappear, what happens to their exclusive economic zone? If an island disappears, if an islandation disappears, who owns that water? Well, we're going to find out in a few years. Tuna can be farmed. Um, people are trying to farm them. But it comes at a tremendous environmental cost. Um, fish actually are kind of good choices when you think about animals to farm. Fish float. Fish are cold-blooded. All those things that in land animals uh, use up a lot of energy, and fish can potentially can be conserved. But when you look at tuna, tuna are actually warm-blooded. Uh, the bigger tunas, the yellowfins, the big eyes, the bluefin, they can heat their body temperature 20 degrees above ambient. And so it can take as many as 20 pounds of forage fish to produce a single pound of farm tuna. Next fish most popular in America is salmon. So salmon, we actually used to have it right here in New England. Um, and one of the reasons we don't have it in New England is, is this little graphic. So this is my home state of Connecticut. And it kind of looks like uh, Connecticut has the measles here. But in fact, actually, every single dot on that map of Connecticut is a dam. There are more than 2,500 dams in the state of Connecticut alone. I often say that this is why people in Connecticut are so uptight. Um, they're, they're, their chi is blocked. If, if some, if, and I can say that for, I'm from Connecticut. If, if we could only unblock Connecticut's chi, I always feel that we'd have a much better society. But, no, but in all seriousness, um, this kind of um, environmental destruction has really taken place all over coasts in the temperate northern hemisphere. Um, I was, you know, made this joke about Connecticut um, at a national park convention in North Carolina. And afterwards, uh, a parks officer sidled up to me and he says, you know, you ought to be you shouldn't be so hard on Connecticut, because we in North Carolina, we got 35,000 dams. So we really have millions and millions of dams. Um, uh, not some that are, aren't even really dams, but they are, you know, they're not even called dams, but they're just obstructions that prevent the energistic flow uh, from river to ocean and back again. So we do, however, still have a lot of wild salmon in this country. Over 200 million pounds of it are caught 
um, in Alaska every single year. But then we do this very strange thing. So about um, a certain amount of that salmon, so I should say 80% of our wild salmon that we catch, we actually export. Um, in, the, in, in return, uh, we import farm salmon mostly from the southern hemisphere. But the wild salmon that we export, some of it goes through this weird process where we catch it in uh, the US, we, s we f freeze it whole, we send it to China, uh, there they bone it, fillet it, take the take bones out, pack it up, refreeze it, and send it back to America double frozen. I was on Fresh Air talking about this, and, and Terry Gross said, um, my mother always said not to double freeze fish. And <laughs> I was, you know, that's true, Terry, that's absolutely true. So meanwhile, as I say, though, a lot of the salmon that we eat um, is farmed and coming to us um, from the southern hemisphere, from Chile. And in the early days of farming salmon, it could take as many as five or six pounds of wild forage fish to grow a single pound of salmon. We've gotten that now down to below two pounds for every pound of salmon we produce. Some people say it's below one pound. But nevertheless, even though we've gotten the per fish average down, we're growing so much salmon that we're still taking more and more forage fish out of the sea every single year. And that is a, a huge amount of fish that's not only fed to salmon, it's also fed to things like chickens and pigs. And I often wonder, so we have chickens, uh, we feed them fish, but what people don't know is we actually also sometimes feed chicken byproducts to fish. So I always wonder, was there ever a ch fish that ate a chicken that ate a fish? I just throw it out there. <laughs> Overall though, laughs aside, this is a very serious issue for the ocean. Because right now, we are taking a, about a third of the world catch, 20 to 30 million metric tons every year of these forage fish are going into the feeding of other animals. The last fish that uh, you know, sort of is in the popular American lexicon of eating is, you know, it, it was cod, but it, the industry now calls it white fish. You know, it's, I, I love when the food, food industry comes up with these sort of all-embracing terms to embrace all of nature. So, the best way that I can describe the progression of whitefish is to look at that icon uh, of American culinary high standards, um, the filet of fish sandwich. So the filet of fish sandwich actually began as halibut. It actually began in a contest that Ray Kroc had. Um, well, so what happened was the Cleveland franchise owner found that nobody was coming into his store on Fridays. Why? Uh, they were Catholic. And so they, he said, I'm going to have a fish sandwich. And, and he said to Ray Kroc, I'm going to make a fish sandwich. And Ray Kroc says, you know, you know what? I'm going to have my own sandwich. It's going to be called the hula burger. And the hula burger was going to be made out of a slice of pineapple on a bun. And Ray Kroc said, let's have a contest. Let's put your sandwich side by side with the hula burger, and we'll see who wins. Well, unfortunately, fish, uh, for fish, it was, it, was, it was the filet of fish sandwich that won. And the one thing stipulation Ray Kroc said is that his original sandwich was made out of um, halibut, and it came in at 27 cents a sandwich. He, uh, Ray said he wanted a 25 cent sandwich. So he went to cod. And we all want to know what happened to cod. Now, uh, New England cod in, in, in free fall, um, the filet fish sandwich is no longer made out of cod. It's now made out of Alaska pollock. Uh, it's now the largest food fish fishery in the, in the United States, two to three billion pounds every single year. But even that is not proving enough. Uh, and now what we're finding is that there's this other fish that's appeared on our menus, the tilapia. And this, to me, is like the ultimate climate change fish. This is a fish that doesn't survive in water that goes below 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, it is a fish that is rapidly increasing its range from south to north, because every time you put it into a pond, if the pond stays above 60 degrees, the tilapia will pretty much take it over. So that has become our default white fish. But in the quest for sort of something that will ultimately feed us well from the sea, the tilapia doesn't necessarily get the job done. Uh, tilapia are not particularly high in omega-3s, and if you're looking for EPA and DHA, in your seafood, the tilapia is not going to do it. So what should we do? What should we eat? How should we go forward? Well, one idea would be to eat the forage fish themselves, those fish that we're feeding to all those salmon and tuna. Very high in omega-3s. Um, very low uh, when it comes to the consumption of fuel. Um, the trawling or the uh, midwater trawling of what are called you know, small pelagics have very, very f low fuel consumption compared to other seafoods. And as I say, very, very high in omega-3s. Other thing we could eat is perhaps something completely that's not even a fish, the mussel. The mussel is as high in omega-3s as canned tuna, um, uh, grows incredibly fast, also does something that is really good for us and that requires very little fuel to bring to market, something like a 30th of the amount of fuel as something like beef. 
requires no forage fish. Um, you don't have to feed a mussel. It gets all its nutrition from filtering the water of microscopic phytoplankton. And in the process, it does this great thing for us. It actually filters the water. The average mussel or clam or oyster can do dozens of gallons of water per individual per uh, day. So it's actually this huge biofilter that we can have in our lives. And this is becoming increasingly important because alongside climate change, a huge issue that's happening in the world right now is the nitrification and phosphorif phosphorification of the ocean, the, the, the fertilizing of the ocean with anthrop anthropogenic sources, causing a huge amounts of algal blooms and eventually what are called dead zones, oxygen poor zones that don't have enough oxygen in there to support diverse life. If we were to introduce filter feeders, in a much more robust way, we might be able to begin to address that. Another thing we could do is potentially go away from animals altogether. We could think about kelp. Kelp is a tremendously interesting creature that is really right there for us on the horizon. Like mussels, they also process a lot of water. Um, they get rid of a lot of nitrogen. They get a lot of, of, those, a lot of those nutrients that cause dead zones. And another interesting thing is, um, Kelp potentially could be used as forage for land animals. So instead of feeding fish to chickens, we could fill, feed cap, kelp to cows. Um, that's a tremendously important step because when you think about it, think about all of the energy, all of the water that goes into growing corn and soy as forage for land animals. But aside from the land animals, aside from land plants, we have to think about the ocean as we get into this area of extreme water scarcity. You don't have to water kelp. You don't have to water it. It's right there. And so that's, if we could figure out how to make that a, a major form of our food sources, I think we could really advance far. The last thing in my sort of foursome of new things to consider is aquaculture. I mean, we can talk about kelp all we like, but ultimately people are going to want to eat a nice piece of fish. So how do we get there? We need to figure out a means of aquaculture and a type of species that will address the major concerns that we are now lacking in aquaculture. We need to find a fish that is vegetarian. It has to be fast growing so that we don't use a lot of energy to bring it to market. It has to be adaptable because we're going to be seeing huge changes in water temperature, acidity, all those kinds of things. And lastly, if we want to have EPA and DHA fatty acids in our farmed seafood, we have to figure out how to have a farmed fish that has that profile. We haven't quite figured it out yet without feeding fish to other fish. And yet, there are a huge amount of alternative feeds out there that can make this possible. If there are any investors in the room who are thinking about the marine space, this to me is such a key, key issue. People have been talking about alternatives to forage fish in aquaculture for years and years and years. It is not scaling up. I don't know why. I would like to see it scale up. So in conclusion, um, I think we should eat from the sea. I think a lot of times people get very confused by seafood. Um, a lot of times they're looking at the salmon, the wild salmon, the farm salmon, the tuna, da, 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 and they're like, you know, forget it, I'm just going to have the beef. When they make that decision, they're causing a huge increase in their carbon footprint. Seafood can be a way to lower our carbon burden on the planet, but we just have to choose the right ones. Instead of choosing these, if we chose these, we might have a little more of these. So thank you. Come on up and Carl, where's Carl? Yeah. Come on up. So what's it like going to a restaurant with you, Paul? <laughs> is it fun? fun? Is it fun yeah. at all? I mean, <laughs> do you, what, you just, just order the mussels and shut up. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right? Much. Is that pretty much it? Yeah. Well, if you can get some kelp noodles, too, that helps. Yeah. So um, is, is uh, aquaculture, it, it's, it's just like everything. It has unintended consequences, as you well pointed out here. Um, it's really the only way that we can sustain seafood as part of our diet collectively as the population grows, right? We most definitely need to have aquaculture. I mean, it's already half of our seafood food uh, profile. The question is, how can we develop in such a way that we, don't, that we end up with a net increase in the amount of marine protein that we have? The, the other important thing, though, is I feel like a lot of times aquaculture gets trapped in the wild versus farmed fish space instead of the fish versus beef space. I mean, really, when you look at the incredible impact that growing beef on land has upon marine systems with all the effluent that comes off of farms, but also upon, you know, with methane emissions, carbon emissions, it would be much better if we could figure out a rational, aqu a rational aquaculture system rather than just cutting down trees and making more beef lots. So better to take out, um, you know, cattle ranching land as opposed to mangrove land, but that's not practical, is it? Well, I don't know. I, I had this perverse thought that what if you had a buyback program whereby 
you, you know, you give an Iowa farmer, I'm going to take your 10, you know, 100 acres of corn, and I'm going to give you 100 acres of kelp. I mean, obviously, he'd feel a little shortchanged. But <laughs> if, we, if we could figure out a way to get positive marine sources of protein and nutrition into our diets, then it might not be such a devil's bargain. The, the idea that uh, people will be you know, going in boats and casting nets to get fish, I mean, how long is that going to last, really? Is, that, is there a lot more fish in the sea than we think? No, I mean, I think that the, you know, we're only getting better at figuring out exactly how many fish there are in the sea. Um, what I think you know, we learned in, in other presentations today was that you know, you, if you rebuild fish stocks, you can actually get a much better yield in the end. But we have to figure out a way to take pressure off them so that we can rebuild them. But there is a plateau. There's, you know, there's a limit to how much productivity we can get out of the wild ocean. All right. So Carl, what do you like at a restaurant? <laughs> what do you go what for? What do I like in a restaurant? Uh, I do what do you stay, eat? I you don't eat that grouper sandwich, do you? No. <laughs> no. I, I eat fish that I catch. I, I do like to go fishing, and I eat fish that I catch. And this question comes up now every single time I give a talk. Somebody asks me, are you a vegetarian? And it's not that simple. You sort of led us down that road. <laughs> because if you, um, so many people would just assume that it's better to eat tofu than it is to eat fish. Mm -hmm. And that is true of probably a lot of fish that are caught with a lot of these very unsustainable methods. But if, uh, if I go catch a fish with a hook and line, uh, it's true that the fish feels panic, and it's true that I've killed a fish. But I have not hurt the ability of the ocean to produce a similar fish. If I eat tofu, it comes from a giant soybean farm that probably used to be part of the tropical coastal forest of Brazil. That will never grow another monkey or another bird. And I think it's much more damaging to do that. So I don't think that being a vegan or a vegetarian is strictly that simple. I think we need a much better informed um, relationship with all of our food. So you, you do worry about the individual panic, but you're thinking of the bigger picture here. Yeah, because, well, the thing about the individual panic is there's a tremendous amount of predation in nature, but all those things get to live uh, and be who they are until the moment the predator shows up and kills them. Whereas with most of our farming system, these animals live miserable, miserable lives and then are killed. They, they live much worse than they die most of the time. So that's another thing that is a factor in, in my thinking. But be that as it, uh, you know, be that as it may, um, in my house, we, we don't buy beef, we don't buy pork, we almost never, I never, I never buy chickens. Sometimes my wife occasionally does. We have a couple of chickens. They give us plenty of eggs. It's wonderful to have them. And uh, we eat really nice food. That is, um, uh, a lot of it we get from a local green grocer. A lot of it is grown on Long Island. We have, we have some idea of where the farms are and who's doing that. That's nice. And uh, much of the warm part of the year, we can do that. And then we eat, we eat mussels. We eat clams. We, we like to go clamming, which is Another thing to just have, you know, a, a real relationship with your food, know, know what the story is. Most of our food is um, totally anonymous. You know, people don't know anything about where it comes from. But if you can have a little story about who got what where, that's a fantastic thing. That's one of the, it's one of the nicest things you can have in your life. So you don't eat anything with an eye that's looking back at you, basically. No, I eat fish that I catch. You do. But I, I you don't, do. Just I don't, those. I don't buy yeah. things with eyes. Okay. Uh, okay. Almost, <laughs> almost <laughs> never. <laughs> Uh, right. once, in a, once in a while, I'll, once in a while, I'll actually buy some fish if I'm really pinched and people are coming to my house and I don't have any and they want fish. But uh, no, usually, usually no eyes. No, and uh, you know, if I, I read an interesting story about somebody did an analysis of where in the world people live the longest and what they eat. Now, causation and and correlation are not necessarily the same, but where people live the longest. They eat, they eat a lot of beans, so eat beans. They're out in that tent <laughs> off to the side. <laughs> so how do, you, how do you feel about aquaculture? How do I feel yeah. about I, I, Aquaculture is a type of farming, and so like all types of farming, some of it is done disastrously, and some of it can be done much better. And it's important to try to keep pressuring the things that do it better. One of the things, I have a small not-for-profit group, and we have a partnership with Whole Foods, and Whole Foods asks us to evaluate things that they are planning to buy. And one thing that we did, I think it was very constructive a few years ago, was uh, they said, well, we have a lot of stuff that you're rating red, never eat, but we're selling it. But we're, 
you know, we want to phase that out. So based on criteria that we help create, they worked with their producers to say, you need to do this change and this change and this change, and then your thing that we really can't buy anymore, we'll give you like a couple of years to work with us to change it, and, and you know, you need to move it into an area of much better sustainability. So I think that pressure was very constructive in that case. Now people know that they can go to Whole Foods and get good stuff, so that pressures other people who are selling seafood to come up to where Whole Foods is, because nobody wants to lose any little bit of market share. You don't want 2% of your customers to go to Whole Foods and that, be able I mean, to say we're as good as them. And that's playing out in the aquaculture space um, where they're trying to move towards feed for their salmon that are coming not from well-caught fish that are directly harvested for that purpose, but rather off-cuts from other fisheries that are then turned into meal and oil that then can be fed to the salmon. I, I know people who will in, never buy the, the farmed salmon. Is that a mistake? I mean, is that a myth? Or is there really a difference between that and the, the wild catch? I, you can tell I'm hungry. <laughs> lunch is <laughs> I'm ready for lunch. Anyway, so. There is a difference. And I, so I, I, won't, I, won't buy, I don't buy farm salmon. Um? I don't buy farm salmon. Don't buy farm salmon. And, and one really great thing about, if you buy wild salmon, it, it's, it's Alaska salmon. Right. And, that, and those guys that catch it are the only thing standing between the continuity of the world's largest remaining salmon population complex and a giant series of mines that will totally destroy all those rivers. So those, those people are the only thing standing between the fish and those mines, and they deserve for us to buy their fish, in my opinion. And it's also a very tremendously interesting and diverse fishery. You know, they've managed it in such a way that you really do have small guys going out and gals going out. Actually, a lot of women captains in Alaska doing a solid day's work to bring fish back. So, yes, I fully support okay. the idea of It's kind of like the family out. farm. You know, I want to keep that going. Yeah. All right, so, Emily, that uh, the fish that you almost let get away, then you, then you caught, did you eat it? Uh, that one might, that was probably a big enough one that was probably sold, yeah. actually. It was yeah. worth more being sold. You know, looking at that, you said that's sustainable, but I saw, you know, they're kind of trampling over the coral reefs and all. It doesn't seem like that would be very yeah. sustainable. How uh, is, I guess the important point here is you have to think about the reef and the fish and the humans who rely on it, right? Exactly. So you're right that, so as a coral ecologist, you're right that that trampling can certainly have direct damage on the corals. A lot of those pictures were taken over a very small area. Uh, so it's mm -hmm. kind of like if we're farming a small area, you're obviously walking up and down your fields and trampling that area. But you still have a lot of other areas that aren't trampled. So I think restrict, you know, these activities occur in small areas uh, and they occur infrequently and that's what makes them sustainable. Now you said at one point that there was a reef that uh, showed all the signs of being, you know, uh, on the way down, but it had a lot of fish associated mm -hmm. with it. How common is that? Yeah, so uh, the tricky part about being a coral ecologist that studies the actual corals is fish don't actually need the corals. They just need the structure. And so that's why there's been a lot of focus on reef restoration efforts, such as dropping concrete balls or concrete mounds and just, or even subway cars in New York to provide some kind of structure or apartment buildings for fish. Uh, so fish don't always need the corals. That said, you know, they, they do need healthy corals. Uh, and so we can spend a lot of money on providing new habitat by dropping subway cars or other things. Um, but we can make much better investments in actually just trying to keep habitat as healthy as possible. So when we lose the coral, we lose the mm -hmm. coral, of course, but we lose fish nurseries too? What, what do we lose? Yeah, so there, there's been some really interesting research showing lag effects. Uh, so you can have a big bleaching event, uh, but it takes about five or seven years for that structure to finally crumble. And once that reef crumbles, then you've got you know a very flat debris field, and that's when you start losing fish. So there can be important lag effects and feedbacks that make that question harder to answer. Um, but one of some work we've done has shown that the number one uh, best predictor of reef fish uh, is just habitat complexity. So the more complex and structures and caves and, and the more of this, yeah, the more unique reefs or structured reefs you can keep, the better for fish. So again, trying to remove local pressures in a strategic way around climate change is to try to keep that structure to keep that fish. Um, but it is, it is a complex ecosystem. And the last thing I'll say is that we're finding new evidence that corals are structured more by climate change and fish are structured more by people. So you've got the same ecosystem in the same place in the ocean being forced by fundamentally different stressors. There's an, a converse thing too, which is that the corals need the fish. Mm -hmm. if, if, you, if you catch all the fish that graze the seaweed, the seaweed grows and baby corals have no place to attach and then you get a seaweed 
rubble mound of dead coral with seaweed. So the, the cor fish don't necessarily need the coral so crucially, but the coral crucially needs the fish. So if you overfish, you lose the whole reef. We're all connected. All right, so, but on, a, on that bleaching, do we know, is it acidification or temperature or both? It's absolutely temperature. It is? Yeah. Uh, so bleaching is a stress response that can be provoked by other things, like even cold temperatures or uh, freshwater outflows from rivers. Um, but the global mass bleaching events that we saw in 1998 that we're very likely going to see in the next few months, that is temperatures. So it's temperatures exceeding a thermal threshold of a coral. So corals live in uh, warm tropical places that make it lovely to go diving on, but they're living at their edge. So any kind of bump uh, in temperature creates a breakdown in the symbiosis between the coral and tiny algae that live in its tissue. If that breakdown and that warm water happens for too long, the coral starves to death. So bleaching is the first sign that a coral is stressed and that symbiosis is broken. Uh, and mass mortality is, is the eventual outcome if those temperatures stay hot for too long. So what are the big consequences then of acidification? Good question. So acidification is really going to be our 50 to 100 year problem. And I think if we can get corals to the place where they're dealing with acidification, then conservation biologists, we've done our jobs. Because right now it is temperature. Um, as Carl was speaking about, uh, Acidification can make it harder for corals to build their skeletons. Uh, so corals are make skeletons out of li basically limestone, and the more acidic it is, their skeletons dissolve. So that's the main problem. Um, a lot of the studies around acidification uh, are around taking baby corals, typically or corals, out of today's water and then putting them in water that's 200 years down the road and not actually giving them that time to respond. So the other interesting thing about temperature and acidification is that acidification is a slow-acting chronic process where individuals can have some heritability and adaptation to that time. Whereas temperature is a very acute shock where all of a sudden you have a marine heat wave, it sits on the corals, and then it's gone again. So that interplay of stressors and their actual acute versus chronic nature is why I think temperature is a bigger problem. What? Go ahead. Uh, um, I, I mean, I think a much more serious thing about acidification, though, has to do on a planktonic level. Mm. Because if you look at the way that solar energy gets to fish, it goes through phytoplankton, which are then eaten by zooplankton, and then in turn eaten by fish. Many zooplankton form calciferous shells. And if we start to lose that rung of the food web, we're toast. Which, among other things, is major food for salmon. Yes. <laughs> it goes round and round here, doesn't it? All right, so any questions from the audience here? Does anybody have anything? Or does everybody want salmon? <laughs> Time for salmon. All right, well, thank you very much, guys. Those are great talks. We appreciate it.